Welcome back to The Daily Poem here on the Close Reads Podcast Network. I'm David Kern, and today is February 11th, 2020. Yesterday, I read a poem by Elizabeth Bishop called The Moose in uh, recognition or remembrance of her birthday, which is February 8th, and so was last Saturday. Uh, The Moose was one of her later career poems, written, I believe, in the 70s. But, you know, Elizabeth Bishop is a important enough poet and a beloved enough poet among many people that I thought I would uh, read um, another poem by her, but this time an early poem. If, uh, you know, if the death of William Butler Yeats is a good occasion to read multiple Yeats poems or Frost's death is an occasion to read multiple Frost poems, then it seems to me that Elizabeth Bishop's birthday is a good occasion to listen to uh, a couple of her poems. So this poem is called The Map, and it's actually uh, the, I believe, the first poem poem that shows up in her book, North and South, which came from 1946. As I mentioned yesterday, she lived from 1911 to 1979, so in 1946 she would have been uh, 35 years old, uh, give or take, I guess, depending when the book came out. But you can see here uh, why, uh, by the the time she was in her 40s, she was already uh, the consultant and poet to the Library of Congress. Uh, This is uh, the kind of poem that shows uh, her early talent. And this is how it goes. The map. Land lies in water. It is shadowed green. Shadows, or are they shallows at its edge, showing the line of long seaweed ledges where weeds hang to the simple blue from green? Or does the land lean down to lift the sea from under, drawing it unperturbed around itself? Along the fine, tan, sandy shelf is the land tugging at the sea from under. The shadow of Newfoundland lies flat and still. Labrador is yellow where the moony Eskimo has oiled it. We can stroke these lovely bays under a glass as if they were expected to blossom or as if to provide a clean cage for invisible fish. The names of seashore towns run out to sea. The names of cities cross the neighboring mountains. The printer here experiencing the same excitement as when emotion too far exceeds its cause. These peninsulas take the water between thumb and finger like women feeling for the smoothness of yard goods. Mapped waters are more quiet than the land is, lending the land their waves own confirmation. And Norway's hair runs south in agitation. Profiles investigate the sea where land is. Are they assigned, or can the countries pick their colors? What suits the character or the native waters best? Topography displays no favorites. North says near as west. More delicate than the historians are the map makers' colors. So, Supposedly, this is a poem um, which scholars and so forth call uh, call this her first New York poem. Apparently, Bishop, who was not from New York originally, had a love-hate relationship with the city of New York and wrote several poems um, to and about it. Um, and it was written apparently during the Christmas season of 1934 originally. She was freshly out of college, I believe, and was not feeling well. I I think I read she had the flu, and she also suffered throughout her life from from asthma. And she was looking at a map, she said, and uh, she said this in 1978 about that poem. She said, quote, My mother's family wandered a lot and loved this strange world of travel. My first poem in my first book was inspired when I was sitting on the floor on New Year's Eve in Greenwich Village, After I graduated from college, I was staring at a map. The poem wrote itself. People will say that it corresponded to some part of me of which I was unaware at the time. This may be true. There's a there's a um, biography of Bishop in which um, supposedly Bishop claims that poetry should show should um, should reveal the mind thinking. And I love the way that quote from her is suggestive of that. People will say that it corresponded to some part of me which I was unaware at the time, or unaware of at the time, and this may be true. <laughs> the phrase, this may be true, is great because 
I like, I can imagine her saying, well, all these people think they know what the poem is about. Maybe they're right. Maybe they're not. Um, but, but the poem also said, you know, the poet also saying, you know, as I look back, the poems do reveal themselves or do reveal things about me when I wrote them that I didn't know about myself at the time, that the work itself is, uh, is revealing things or painting a picture of who I was at a different time in my life. And here we have a very young, uh, we have a young Elizabeth Bishop here and you can see the talent kind of, oozing out. Um, it's not as uh, profound as some of her later work and others of her earlier work even. It's not um, perhaps as formally interesting as other work that she would eventually work on. But you can you can sort of see, as I said, the talent oozing out of this, out of in between the lines here, if, if you'll permit the kind of gross uh, metaphor there. And if it's true that the mind thinking is what poetry ought to do, that it ought to show the mind thinking or reveal it. It shouldn't be surprising then that this is a poem that has many questions in it, kind of rhetorical questions even. So it asks, does the land lean down to lift the sea from under? Is the land tugging at the sea from under? Are the colors assigned or can the countries pick their colors? All leading to the, the final line, which is one of her more well-known final lines, more beloved final lines, more delicate than the historian's are the map maker's colors. More delicate than the historians are the map maker's colors. I found a, a letter from the 40s, the late 40s, uh, a portion of a letter that was quoted on a blog post. And Bishop writes in that letter, I always like to feel exactly where I am geographically all the time on the map. And you can, you can see in this poem... Uh, a sort of rootlessness at work here, you know, a desire to be rooted and that desire when it's not fulfilled, leading a sort of internal dissonance, leading to an internal dissonance that she's trying to work out in the poem here. And the working out of that, the mind at work, the soul sort of uh, searching for something within itself is on display in this poem. And I think that's one of the things that makes this poem interesting and memorable. And, uh, you know, when you compare it to her later work, you see her mind and her soul uh, at work uh, you know, even more. And you can, you can imagine, you know, these poems in conversation with one another, uh, ultimately creating a sort of whole story or whole picture of this person. Um, and I suppose that's what all poetry does, but it seems like Bishop herself was very interested in that concept. Um, so one more time, here is this early poem by Elizabeth Bishop, The Map. Land lies in water. It is shadowed green. Shadows, or are they shallows, at its edges showing the line of long seaweeded ledges where weeds hang to the simple blue from green? Or does the land lean down to lift the sea from under, drawing it unperturbed around itself? Along the fine tan sandy shelf is the land tugging at the sea from under? The shadow of Newfoundland lies flat and still. Labrador's yellow, where the moony Eskimo has oiled it. We can stroke these lovely bays under a glass as if they were expected to blossom or as if to provide a clean cage for invisible fish. The names of seashore towns run out to sea. The names of cities cross the neighboring mountains. The printer here experiencing the same excitement as when emotion too far exceeds its cause. These peninsulas take the water between thumb and finger like women feeling for the smoothness of yard goods. Mapped waters are more quiet than the land is, lending the land their waves' own confirmation. And Norway's hair runs south in agitation. Profiles investigate the sea where land is. Are they assigned, or can the countries pick their colors? What suits the character or the native waters best? Topography displays no favorites. North says near as west. More delicate than the historians are the map maker's colors. This has been The Daily Poem. Thanks so much for listening. I'll be back tomorrow with another poem for you.